Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Round the Horn. Our special guest today is an old friend, owns a music studio teaching lessons. His name is Paul Sally, but more importantly for today, he's got a relative in the record books. Hello, Paul. How are you? Hello, Lee. I'm doing great. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, give us a little bit of your musical background first. Uh, well, I was I learned piano from age seven, and I went all through high school learning piano. And then in high school, I went to the Juilliard Pre-College Division, and I graduated from there. I spent two years at Southern Methodist University in Dallas on a music scholarship. And then I transferred to Berkeley in Boston and got my degree from Berkeley. Oh, that's and great. And now you have a music school of your own. I do. It's called Music University, and it's in Freehold, New Jersey. And we have teachers for pretty much pretty much every instrument. Um, we've had we have a lot of students. We have about twelve rooms that we use, and uh, we have rock band classes. We have uh, vocal group classes. Um, it's it's just great. We do performances pretty much all over the the county and the state. We do benefit shows. We we play a show every two years for Make a Wish Foundation at their castle in Monroe. And uh, it just gives the kids a lot of opportunities to perform. That's great. Music is a very important part of everyone's life. Yep. Now let's get to the the, uh, the reason why we're here today, and that's talking baseball. Now, first of all, from what I remember, you had mentioned uh, that you had played vintage or heritage baseball at one time. So there is a... a, a collection of teams that play, that play in the style and uniforms. And they're basically recreators of a time period of baseball before, before gloves. So they, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I said the first time they said that to me too. They said, we play by the rules without the gloves. And I go, well, I don't care what the rules are. What about the gloves? <laughs> so the, the rules were always different depending upon the year. So some years, you could catch the ball on a bounce and that was considered an out. There's other ones where you could hit the ball and as long as it hit fair first and then went foul, that's a fair ball. So people were hitting the ball, people were hitting the ball down and it was shooting backwards. Um, playing catcher, not so good, not a good job. Um, but the ball was a little softer. It's not as hard as you think. It's more rubbery. But they're pitching underhand as well but the distances are shorter for the pitching now. And so you're still pitching underhand, but you can get some speed on it for sure. Um, the bases are long distance, you know, they're the normal 90 feet, I believe. And um, stealing is a huge part of the game because there, was, there wasn't really, there was a block rule, but you could really just pretend to throw to first, pretend to throw to first, and then throw it home. And that wasn't a block. <laughs> just because the stealing you, you you take off i mean that was everything and i wasn't the fastest for sure <laughs> so they're always like you gotta steal second i was like i just got the first give me a break <laughs> <laughs> no ricky henderson here <laughs> no and there, there's really no home runs or anything like that because your bats they're like 40 ounces and up they're just huge wooden sticks and because the ball is a little more rubbery, it just doesn't go as far. So your job was not to hit the ball as hard as you could. It was to hit them where they ain't, you know, hit them between the, the bat, the fielders. And they've, they've got a job too, because they're barehanded out there. You know, it's, it's not, it's not easy. And, you know, there's a lot of historical guys who go out and do it. And so there's a lot of older guys who play, but those guys have figured it out and they play great. And, you know, I watch them play and I'm like, okay, Teach me how to do this because when you catch, it hits your hand all the time and bounces out. So you gotta you gotta really grab the ball in. Right. So it's right. a lot of fun though. It's a lot of fun recreating it. It sounds a little bit like the, the the kind of softball they play in Chicago. I don't know if you've heard about it, but no. they play without gloves and the ball is actually bigger than a regular softball. And I think there was a movie that was uh, all about it, but they play barehanded as well, too. I think maybe the only guy that has a, a glove is the catcher. But uh, it's interesting because the ball is even bigger. It, it looks more like a cantaloupe than a softball. And well, it's, it's getting pretty popular. They have big tournaments in Gettysburg where they have a ton of teams come out. 
a three-day tournament. Um, there's a tournament in Rochester where all the teams from the East Coast and like Ohio, they all gather there and they do this tournament on a field that looks like you are in the 1800s. It's really amazing. Really? They're all, they're all decked out in period uniforms. Um, the umpires, you know, and the umpires calling balls and strikes when you're a pitcher, it's a nightmare because they don't have to call a ball or a strike. They can just say no pitch. <laughs> and you're like, what do you mean no pitch? They're like, well, it was close enough for a strike, but it wasn't really, but it really wasn't bad enough to be a ball. <laughs> you just hang your head because you're about to throw all these pitches, you know, and and even the batter sort of like, all right, I'll wait for That's another. Got to be frustrating, <laughs> right? And then when they finally call a strike, you're like, thank you, <laughs> you know. But it, it was hard. Um, so yeah. Well, from what our uh, conversations were in the past, you had brought up uh, something very interesting uh, about a relative of yours. Yes. So let's get into. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sally from way back when in Ohio. So when I was younger, my father had told me that we had a relative that played pro baseball. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, not really being into it because all I cared about was Tom Seaver and the Mets and he wasn't him. So, so I, his name was Harry Slim Sally. And I start one day I was in the library and I said, you know what, let's look up a microfilm. Let's look up the baseball encyclopedia. And there it was, and they had his stats. And I was like, oh, all right, he played a decent amount. So then I started looking up microfilms, like New York Times, to see if there were any box scores or whatever. And he was on, like, every page. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. So then the research bug sort of got into me, and I started becoming obsessed with researching his life, his career, his life after baseball, and it just became an obsession. So I've pretty much traveled to every city he's played in, as well as every minor league city he's played in, because the local newspapers are all in these cities. For right. example, yeah. for example, he played he played for Williamsport in 1907. Well, it was in a league called the Tri-State League, which has maybe seven or eight cities within New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania. Well, I was like, all right, I can do that in a trip or two. So off to these little towns like Johnstown and Altoona and, and Wilmington, Delaware, and even Trenton, New Jersey. And sure enough, it was such a big deal back then, this league, the minor leagues, because it was their town. And they were very, very proud of their town, Ball. So they have extensive articles on the players, on the fields, on the games, on every game, on all the – teams coming to town and pictures and so then that just it just avalanche there and I have filing cabinets of box scores and articles and pictures and things like that um, we went to his hometown in Ohio which is a town called Higginsport and in Higginsport uh, there's about 300 people it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's described as a wide spot in the road Okay. <laughs> and so we were there and sure enough there were some relatives there that not relatives but people from the town some old timers who actually knew him and worked with him and just before he died in 1950 he coached the local team and the local team won the championship that year in 1948 so guess what every building bank town hall post office they have this team photo from 1948 still up on the wall and like every little bar and everything That's and it's, i walked in and i was just like i just saw that in the other building they're like oh yeah that was when they won the championship i was like that was 60 years ago <laughs> <laughs> it's a big thing though huh and it's a huge thing and they were very proud of him so i interviewed a lot of the the locals and they introduced me then to one of his nieces from Cincinnati and it went from there and so we we put up a plaque in this town because there was no plaque they dedicated the field to Slim Sally Field um, a few years later we had a we, we, we got him inducted into the Ohio Baseball Hall of Fame because that's where he's from and we gave a speech and Buddy Bell was there he was actually being inducted as well um, and so so the obsession has become crazy <laughs> what major league team did he pitch for so he was drafted first off he was drafted by the yankees 
um, in 1906, uh, the end of 1906. He was playing with the Birmingham Barons. He got drafted by the Yankees. He spent three weeks with the Yankees, and but got in a huge fight with the manager, Clark Griffith. So much so that Clark Griffith wouldn't even let him warm up. He told him to go out front and help sell tickets. <laughs> and he was like, that's it. The emotion right there. <laughs> right, right. So he was like, all right, we have a problem. So he was released to Williamsport. Um, and then from Williamsport, the, the Cardinals drafted him. So he goes to St. Louis in 1908. He pitches for the Cardinals from 1908 to 1916. Um, Miller Huggins was his manager. Roger Bresnahan was his manager at one time. And he was not a um, – how do I put this nicely? He was not always in condition, as the old newspapers wrote. He was out of condition, which was another word for drinking. Okay. okay. <laughs> so they didn't want to publish that he was a drinker and, right. you know, completely off the wagon. But that's what he did. And he, his teammate was Bugs Raymond for a year or two. And Bugs Raymond was a notorious drinker. And all of a sudden, those two were buddies. Okay. So that, that sort of started his decline. He would get suspended. He'd get fined. One week he'd disappear, and they couldn't find him. And one <laughs> one time he got on a boat and headed down the Mississippi and came back. He goes, yeah, I wanted to see if I wanted to be a, a captain of a boat. And they were like, y you were supposed to pitch. <laughs> and they were like, well, you're, you're suspended now and whatever. <laughs> That's hilarious. So that kept going on every year. But at the same time, every paper – reported how great he was. And he was a left-handed uh, crossfire pitcher, which is, means that when he, when he pitches, he steps towards first base yes, and then, come, comes, then across comes across the spot. The spot. Right. Yeah. So everyone complained it looked like he was throwing from first base. But he had, a, like, amazing control. So when he was in condition, he was considered one of the best left-handers of his time. Um, but you don't hear about him because you hear about Christy Mathewson, you hear about, you know, Walter Johnson, all these other guys of that time period. Sure. Um, because, did of course, Dizzy his, Dean? say again? Did he play with Dizzy Dean? He did not. He ended in 1921. Okay. All right. Good. So 1916 comes, and he's actually got Rogers Hornsby as a rookie on his team. <laughs> but so, so they come to New York, and they're playing the Giants, and he disappears for three days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then he comes back to the hotel and he comes up with this excuse that he's going to quit the team because his his team wasn't getting the same food that the other teams were getting. And so he says, that's it, I quit. Okay, well, miraculously enough, guess who signs him and, or trades for him a month later? The Giants. Which everyone says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were gone for three days and you were in New York. And they said, obviously, he was tampered with by the Giants. Sure, by, yeah. By, by John McGraw. Right. And everyone says, no, 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 no. But you, you can be sure of it. Because when he was with the Cardinals, Cardinals were awful. I mean, they were the worst team in the league by far for years and years. You know, his best, his best record with the Cardinals, he was 19 and 15. But the team only won 52 games. Okay, so he won. Okay. <laughs> so he was the guy. I mean, he was everything. So he gets on the Giants. He's part of the Giants in 1916 for the 26 game winning streak. And now he's on a winning team. So 1917 comes. 1917, they go to the World Series. He's got a great record, super small ERA, and they play the White Sox. Okay, so this is the 1917 White Sox. So he pitches game one and game five. He loses them both. He loses. Uh, he loses one of them, and no decision on the other. Um, nineteen eighteen, he hurts his back. He's released. Nineteen nineteen, the Reds sign him. So now he's on the Cincinnati Reds in nineteen nineteen, and he's off to the World Series. Okay, and it's also his first twenty game season, twenty win season. My bad. So nineteen nineteen is also significant for his his uh, his stats because he had twenty one wins but he only gave up 20 walks for the entire season. For the entire season, wow. <laughs> and he only had 24 strikeouts for the entire season. Entire season. <laughs> and it was like 220-something innings. It was one of those absurdities. Like he, sure, yeah, right. They said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I got eight guys behind me. Why do I need to put out any more effort? I'm just going to throw it over and see what happens. 
okay. <laughs> but it worked. So right. he goes he goes to the World Series against the famous Chicago White Sox of 1919. Um, his quote is that I had no idea that anything was going on. I thought they were playing pretty good. So he wins game two. Uh, then game either six, six or seven, I'm not sure. He loses because now Eddie Seacott is back to playing the way he should be. Is he in the movie? He's only in the movie for a snippet of, of game two where they show him pitching. Okay. And that's it. That's it. Um, ESPN did a, a documentary on it, and they had me come up for that too, uh, to, do, to do an interview for that. We have the video of that. I think, I think I'm on the cutting room floor, but they use some of my information. <laughs> I, I don't think my face had video all over it. <laughs> So, so the end of 1919, he wins the World Series. You know, he wins his bonuses. He wins all this extra money. He gets a bigger contract. And now, finally, he's on winning teams, pitching the way he should have been for the last eight years. Right, sure. So, so of course, you know, what if he was on those teams for those first eight years? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, then, then everyone would be talking about him. Sure. Because, because, you know, he still has the lowest ERA in Cardinals history. Now, there's a, I think from our past conversations, there's a record that he holds. Which one is that? He pitched the shortest major league game. It was, it was 55 minutes long. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a full nine innings. Right. And, and he only pitched 65 pitches. That was the whole game. And he and, lost. And, and he, he lost. lost. <laughs> he lost three to one. But that was against Brooklyn. So. So and no strikeouts probably. Oh, I don't remember, but I'm sure there wasn't many. I'm sure it, it went fast. You know, it was one of those things. Five minutes is unbelievable. Unbelievable, right? I mean, you're talking about on the field, off the field, a couple pitches. Again, 65 pitches in nine innings. That's seven per inning. Yeah, that that's unbelievable. So it's like uh, throw it up there and see what they do. Yeah. So, so then 1921, he comes back uh, to the Giants. And he's on the 1921 Giants, but now he's pretty much a reliever. His, his starting days are over because they, at that point, they outlawed all the, the trick pitches. So one of his things was using rosin on his fingers because he perspired a lot. So now he can't use rosin at all to throw the ball. So now his, his pitching is... Not as effective, let's just say. Okay, sure. So now he's a reliever. So he pitches the Giants, you know, to the World Series as well. It's against Babe Ruth and the Yankees. Um, but not, they don't use them in the World Series. And my favorite newspaper article that I found, <laughs> in the middle of one of the games, they stopped the game because he had come out from the bullpen in center field and was sitting down on, the, on a chair against the fence. <laughs> and they were like, you got to get off the field. He's like, well, all right, they're not using me, so I figured I'd come watch the game. <laughs> so he's finally released. 1922, he goes and plays for Toledo, uh, the Mud Hens, which is like a – it's like an all-star team of former players. You know, sure, Roger, right, yeah. Roger Bresnahan's the manager. Ferdy Shoup is on the team. You know, Fred Luteris, all these players that he played with. And it's not so good. You know, he's – Oh, because Bill, Bill Terry's on the team as a rookie, uh, okay. as minor leaguer, and Freddie Lindstrom as well, who were, you know, two monsters for the Giants. Right. So then he comes back, and he goes back to his little town, and he opens a bar, and he opens a, a cafe, and he opens an ice house, and he's selling soda bottles and things like that. He has a soda company, um, and he's doing really well with all his money until 1937, when the Ohio River floods and takes all of it. Floods oh. everything. He loses everything, oh, including his 1919 World Series pin. Oh wow! <laughs> so, so then a couple of years later, he's back in Higginsport after you know working in Cincinnati as a bartender. And he spends the rest of his life in Higginsport, uh, you know, being being the local guy. Right. Sure. You know, they had a they have a group called the Baseball Players of Yesteryear, and he was part of that. And you know, all the famous players did like the the reunion the, the old timers day games and stuff like that right and he, he, yeah and he'd go to those at the games and he'd pitch a little bit and there's a few articles of that um and then he'd scout a few players here and there from the local teams and you know call his call whoever to to tell him that this guy's okay sure um a couple articles of him flying to new york to go watch the world series 
but but he was pretty laid back. He was not a, you know, city guy. He was a farmer. You know, he had uh -huh. tobacco farms and stuff like that. And that's where he spent the rest of his life. His wife died in 1948, and he died in 1950. And uh, you know, a bunch he, of famous ball players came as pole bearers too. So. Wow. And he got his name because he was skinny, right? So he was six foot three, and he weighed 160 pounds. <laughs> and they called him the human bean pole. They called him scissors. <laughs> they called him the eye of the needle. You know, stuff like that. And, and Slim just stuck. And for some reason, somewhere along the line, the sheriff of Higginsport was was used. And, and he's like, I was never sheriff. I don't know why they keep calling me that. And some sports writer says, well, you look like you could be. And he was like, uh, all right. <laughs> so, yeah, 6'3", 160. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, he threw left and he batted righty. Uh, he only hit two home runs in his whole life. He is the last St. Louis Cardinal pitcher to steal home, though. He did that. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous stuff. It seemed like everywhere, every time he got involved with something, though, or he was always in the middle of something that, that went wrong. Like in 1905, he's in Birmingham, and he breaks his hand. They send him to Meridian, Mississippi, and the league gets shut down because he's got the, the league has yellow fever. Okay. So he comes back to the – to the Cardinals, they're terrible, blah, 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 blah. In 1917, he's the first player uh, to sign his contract against the wishes of the baseball fraternity, which is planning a big strike. He's the first one to sign it. So if they kick him out, okay, great. <laughs> strike you know, Right, the 1919 thing, you know, just it just it goes on and on and on. There's all sorts of different things where I'm like, you were just in the middle of everything. <laughs> like, how did this? And happen nobody to you? knows about you. <laughs> nobody knows about you. Exactly right. You know, um, baseball historians who study like the big time players, they know about him because obviously he pitched against them. Sure. All the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but they don't really know know him. I consider myself the authority of the world. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Only because nobody else cares. Right. <laughs> so he's the, he holds the record for the absolute shortest game ever. Shortest pro game, yeah. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Of, all the, of all the things to be known for. Right. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, that's, that's pretty much a, a – it's a real great record only because that, you know, today's games are going into three hours. And so yeah. it's rare that you ever see a game in the two-hour range. But here's one that's under an hour. Under an hour. Full game. Nine innings. Right. Exactly. Nine yeah, innings. It wasn't, wasn't range shortened or anything. In an average of seven pitches per inning. So the other thing, that 21 wins and 20 walks – um, that comes up every now and then when somebody gets close. Like Brett Saberhagen had the last one to, to come close. And I don't remember his numbers, but it was close enough where they said, oh, that's the same record that Slim Shali held. And to see that in the news, I'm like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, so I always kind of look, keep on the lookout for the, the more wins than walks thing. But, yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, you were also a member of Saber. I was, yes. I am. I was for a long time, but I had to stop, but I'm going to rejoin. Saber, Saber's really great, and people only really know about it because pro baseball says, oh, it's all the math and it's all this. It's not just the math and the science of baseball. It's the history. Like, I belong to the Dead Ball Era Committee, and they do extensive research on these games and trying to find things that happen that – people don't know about or, or are wrong. They correct mistakes. You know, certain, certain players, they find RBIs that were missing, things like that. Um, but then you find other relatives of players who played with your own relatives. And then the, the collaboration starts. Right. Collaboration is tremendous. They have a uh, – they came out with two books, The Dead Ball Era, uh, the National League and the American League, and I did a couple bios in there. But they came, their main project, they have a pictorial committee, which is amazing. They're trying to find a, a picture of every pro player of all time. Wow. And that's not easy because some people came up for one game or whatever, sure, and they're yeah. from a little town in Iowa, and you're like, all right, so how do we find this? 
So these people grab a player and say, all right, this is my, my project. I'm going to go find that picture. And what I was saying before about the minor league towns having such pride in their players, That's right. you go back to those newspapers and they've got a picture of everybody on the team or they've got a picture of the new guy coming up. And it's really, really amazing. When, when, Slim was, when Slim was drafted by the Yankees, I was like, well, there'll never be a picture of him in the Yankees. I found in the New York Sun a photo of him with a big NY throwing a pitch. <laughs> I, I almost fell off my chair. Wow. There's a picture of him in a Yankee uniform with well, the Highlanders at the time. Yes. And he, and he never pitched a game for him. He never got in a game. But there he is in uniform, and it was it was stunning. Yeah, it was one of those things where you yell out out loud. You're like, you can't believe what you're looking at. Sure, exactly. But that committee is tremendous for finding photos of players, just so that, like, you have a photo when you go to Baseball Reference. There's a photo. It's because of these guys, the Saber Group, sure. that all these players now have a face and not just a number in a book. Right. Well, we run out of time, Paul. It's been great talking to you and so interesting to hear the stories of Slim Sally. Amazing. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Spread the news. Our yeah. thanks to Paul Sally, my friend and a historian in his own right, member of Sabre's Dead Ball Era Committee, and relative of Slim Sally, who holds the major league record for the shortest game ever of 55 minutes. Thanks, Paul. Hey, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching Round the Horn. Good night.